Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. You can stand with us in praise. Okay. We're going to see if you remember the hand motion to this song. It was a long, long time ago now. You came from heaven. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt you paid from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Now let's try it together. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death you paid from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. stand and join with us in a responsive reading uh, and then in uh, singing of hymn number 262, uh, Holy, 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 as we prepare our hearts uh, for worship together today. I'm going to be reading the non-bolded text, which is the individual, and the bolded text is the congregational portion. 642, Christ's exalt, exaltation. 
If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, that each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. And now remain standing and turn. Um, 262, I believe it is. Holy, holy, holy. Worshiping with us today, and I'm going to ask if you would to take your Bibles with me, and we're going to continue in our study of some of the life of Paul in the book of Acts. Uh, we'll be in Acts chapter 12. If you're using a pew Bible, there it's page 1268. Uh, we'll be there in a few moments. Uh, if you recall, just a couple of weeks ago uh, in our study, as we considered together some of the things with the Apostle Paul, it was the aspect of how we could better bless the church, how we could bless the church and its ministry, uh, noting together the importance of 
being faithful even in the small things in our life as a Christian, and then certainly allowing uh, the Lord as a result of our fellowship and so on, those aspects of life to be uh, promising for the Lord. We saw in the life of Barnabas there, uh, if you remember, the importance of somebody standing beside, in this case it was the Apostle Paul, but the importance of having somebody that stood beside you, somebody that encouraged you, somebody that you knew. And then we discussed and talked together about the importance of greeting one another, knowing one another, being a part of the church family, uh, and all of those aspects that we saw there. And so it's important to continue as we think about those, those parts of the study. And I'd encourage you then, as we did last time, to you know, think about your gifts, think about the abilities that you have to be able to better serve the Lord. And then that's obviously to enhance the church. Keep this in mind. Every one of us are uniquely placed in the body of Christ. We are here for a specific purpose. Uh, we may not all know what each other's purpose is, but we are specifically here. So the, the encouragement a couple of weeks ago, shake off the cobwebs, if you would, get out of our comfort zone, so to speak, and let's begin to serve the Lord in, in various accents. If you need uh, a little bit of a reminder, I'd encourage you, a precursor to today's message, to grab a CD from a couple of Sundays ago. So we're going to take a look today here in Acts chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, uh, if you would, please turn there with me. Uh, the concept that we'd like to think about, the theme of the message today, is what are the expectations uh, when I serve God faithfully? What should I expect as I serve God? And we're going to see that here in the life of, of Paul. And I want you to take a look there in chapter 12. I want to give you a little bit of the historical background. Uh, basically, we're going to be in chapters 12 through 14 today uh, of the book of Acts. We cannot obviously uh, take a look at every aspect of it. But I want to share a couple of things for you uh, from the idea or the theme of the expectations of what happens when I serve God. So let's look at the, the background first of all. If you notice in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now about that time... Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. And then he even killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. This is King Herod Agrippa I. He's persecuting the church. He's doing everything he can to destroy the ministry of the gospel that now Saul, and then later on Paul, as we call him with his, with his uh, Greek understanding or his Roman name, then the apostle Paul is going to continue to teach and he wants to do everything he can to destroy that. Notice in verse 3 then, he puts Peter into prison. And so he's doing everything he can to defeat the gospel of Jesus Christ. In chapter 12, as you would continue to read through there, especially in verses 5 through 17, this was the... Uh, point of history where Peter was delivered from prison. Remember his chains fell off and he goes to the house where these people were praying and little Rhoda, the little girl comes and, and she answers the door and they, they're all praying and they just don't believe that Peter's been delivered from prison. That's what they were praying for if you recall, but they don't believe it. That's another message all of its own. Uh, we'll take a look at that at some other time. It's a very, very fascinating thing. We've talked about that before. I want you to go down to verse 23 then. So after all of this, these events, God destroys Herod just like he had promised, just as it was said uh, even before. And in verse 23 it says, The angel of the Lord struck Herod because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. And that's kind of a gruesome death, but that's what was promised to Herod, and that's exactly what took place. Now I want you to notice what happens then. Look at verse 24. This is very important because in verse 24, it says the word of God grew and did what? Multiply. Even in the midst of all of what is going on, all of the persecution of the church, all of the things that are going on, the church grows under the persecution. And that's the important aspect of this particular chapter as we move into the thoughts of what are the expectations of serving God faithfully. And we'll mention this a little bit later on, but listen, church, we need to understand something. This is another great message that we've, we've looked at before, and it's very simply this. The church will grow under persecution, even in the day and age in which we live. So let's take a look if we could. What are some of the expectations? What should I expect? Paul is a great example to us, and I think he shares with us some things we can see from the life of what goes on here uh, this morning. The first aspect is very simply this. It's found in chapter 13, the first 12 verses. And what we find from Paul or Saul's life, if you're going to serve God, if you're going to serve God, you have to understand and be expecting 
God is going to give some great victories in your life and in the life of the church. There will be great victories. So you need to be excited about that. And I want to start with that aspect. Notice in verse 1, he goes to the church at Antioch. And up to this point, he was in Jerusalem. Barnabas was probably the leader. If you look back at the verse 25, notice the, the setting there. It says Barnabas and Saul go. So if we take a look at that verse, we kind of get an idea that Barnabas was kind of leading, leading the troops. And obviously it was because, if you remember, Saul had been persecuting the church. So Barnabas is now kind of the leader, and that's going to become significant a little bit later on. Chapter 13, from that point on, is a focus of the church at Antioch, along with the three missionary trips that uh, Paul takes into Rome. And I want you to notice, you can, we could read through here, but we're not going to take time to read all of these verses. But you'll notice that what happens then is they go to Seleucia, then they eventually end up at Barnabas' home in Cyprus, they stop in Salamia, and they end up in Paphos. Now, I want you to go down to verse 6, because this is where we see what takes place uh, and a great victory uh, in, in, this, in the life of this particular time in Paul's life. Beginning in verse 6, here's what we read. When they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Barjesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Pallas, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul, and he sought to hear the word of God. So the leader, the proconsul, we, we would understand that to be uh, somebody who would be the governor, the governor of Cyprus. That would be an understanding in, in our, in our uh, day and age. So they call, he calls for Barnabas and Saul, verse 7. He wants to hear the word of God. But if you'll notice there, Elasmus, the sorcerer, that was his translated name, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, and if you remember weeks ago we told you, this is the very first time you find Paul now beginning to use his Roman name, here in chapter 13, verse 9. Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, and he said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you. You shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. I want you to notice, if you would here, we have a tremendous, there's a tremendous victory in this particular instance in Paul's life. He is sharing the word of God, and God is at work in the life of this governor, of this leader. And listen, church, there will be many, many times in your life as a Christian and in the life of the church, and we need to celebrate it, that many, many times when we are going to have great victories for God. And we need to be, we need to be thankful for that. I think far too many times, think about when you discipline your kids. How, how, how often do we spend, we spend 90% of our time correcting our children instead of spending 90% of our time trying to encourage them and build them up? And I want you to notice that here in this, as you serve the Lord faithfully, there's going to be great victories here in the ministry at the church. There will be great ministries. We've already seen it. We've seen marriages that have been healed. Praise God. Marriages that were split apart. And God has gloriously healed those marriages. We've seen people come to a saving knowledge of God. People that are hurt get encouraged. They come into the ministry and other people were able to help them. And, and there's been spiritual growth in people's lives. All of these sins are great people. Souls will be changed because God is at work, church. Amen? Amen. He is at work. And you need to celebrate the victories. In this particular instance in Paul's life... Here he is, he's preaching the word of God, and this is a tremendous victory in verse 12. Because the governor of this land, the proconsul, the leader, if you would, some of us may think of him in terms of a mayor or a city leader. The point is, this man, who is in a great position, comes to an understanding of Jesus Christ. And he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just encourage you, church, never be discouraged. Because the second point is very, very clear, beginning in verse 13. There will be, there will be disappointments in ministry. 
There will be disappointments in, in our church ministry. There will be disappointments in your life. I want to point out to you there in chapter 13 in the very, uh, or excuse me, verse 13. Notice now the way, that it's, the way that it's written. It now says, now when Paul and his party set. So evidently, right now, there is a change. There's a change in leadership, so to speak. Because before Barnabas was leading the group, now Paul, as he begins to become more of a leader, more of a preacher and teacher, uh, he is now mentioned as a leader. Notice in the latter part of verse 13, one of the people on the team leaves. And that is very, very disappointing. If you're in a church ministry and you have somebody who steps away from their position of leadership, it is very, very disappointing. And we need to understand as a church that there will be disappointments in our ministry. There will be disappointments even in your own life that you have to deal with. And in fact, if you go over to Acts chapter 15, you don't need to turn there necessarily, but I'll just point out to you, in verses 36 to the end of the chapter there, verse 30, 41, Paul talks about John Mark leaving. And he says he, he didn't feel it was unjust, he thought it was unjustified. Maybe, maybe John Mark was homesick. Most people believe that because Barnabas was his cousin and he now is no longer the leader of the ministry, that he didn't like that, and so he stepped away from ministry for a poll. We don't really know. But the point is, there will be disappointments. There's going to be disappointments in ministry. And let me just tell you this up front. All right? The elders of this church will do everything they can to serve God, to do things of the Lord, but we will disappoint you from time to time. Do you believe that? It's going to happen. Amen. All right? Amen. It's going to happen. That's just the way it is. All right, and we need to understand in the church and in the ministry, there are going to be disappointments. Now go to verse 14 of this same chapter here in chapter 13. Now he's going to Galatia. It's another city called Antioch. It's not Syria where they were before. Here we have the longest message of the Apostle Paul uh, shared with us here in the scriptures. He reviews the life of David. And I want you to go down to verse 23 of chapter 13. And in verse 23, we understand the basis of what he is preaching about. He says, <clears throat> from this man, seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel, whom? A Savior, and we know that Savior to be whom? Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul begins to preach, and he recounts the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, in essence, that's the gospel. That's the gospel message. So here is Paul, and he's preaching this, and, and he's, he's sharing the word of God. And we need to understand, this is, this is very, very important in Paul's teaching, because what happens now, go down to verse 39, and again, I encourage you to read these chapters on your own, but I want you to notice in verse 39 what he says about Christ. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by what? By the law of Moses. It's Christ who justifies. So Paul is now beginning to teach that, and they, so that they would understand it's not the works of the law that save your soul. It's not the works that save you. So here you are ministering for God. You need to be reminded of this. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. For by what? Grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of what? Works. Works. So it isn't a matter of me working. And Paul is trying to get them to understand this change in teaching. Because the law had specific, if you would, guidelines or actions or works. Things that they had to do. Not only on certain days, but certain aspects, if you would, of worshiping God. That's a stark contrast to what Paul is preaching here. And it's a stark contrast to where we are today. We do not live our salvation based on what we do. Our salvation is based on the grace of God. It's what God has provided for us. And we're going to see that throughout the teaching, not only here, but in the weeks to come. Notice, if you would, down in verse 42. The leaders then say, hey, we like this. We're, we're encouraged by, we like this message. So I don't know how often this happens in a preacher's life. But notice verse 20, 42. When the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached by them the next Sabbath. They couldn't wait to come back to church. They couldn't wait to get back in the house of God. They couldn't wait to hear the preaching of God's word. Now, you'll notice the emphasis there on the word Sabbath. 
And I'll just give you a little teaser. In a couple of weeks, uh, our doctrinal study is going to be on the difference between the Sabbath and the Lord's Day. Very important understanding of the difference between those two. We'll do that in a couple of weeks. Notice verse 44. There's a crowd. A whole bunch of people show up the next Sabbath. It says the whole city came out to, because they wanted to hear the Word of God. They were excited about the Word of God. Let me just, let me just pause for a moment and tell you something that you need, to be, you, need to be under, you need to understand. If you are faithful in serving God, and you're faithful and I'm faithful in teaching and, and talking to people about the things of God, they're going to want to be in the house of God to hear the Word of God. It's going to draw people in. You know, sometimes we think, well, somebody doesn't believe in the things of God. Listen, you share the testimony of what God is doing in your life. You share the testimony of what he's doing in your church life, how you're doing various things for God. It will draw people, and the Word of God will draw them into his presence. And then they'll begin to hear. And then prayerfully, uh, they come to a saving knowledge and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, if you would, verse 45. Now what happens? There's a big opposition. This is exactly what is happening today. We shared this a couple of weeks ago. This is exactly what is happening in our nation today. The Jews, that saw, they saw the multitudes. They were filled with envy. They were contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed what Paul was pre preaching. What are they opposing? They're opposing the Word of God. Do you not see that today in our, in our society? We see a direct opposition to the things of God. Shared with you uh, last week, I believe it was. It's just so sad that we, have, that we have a president in this case, but we have, if you would, people who have just turned away from the things of God. We had the National Day of Prayer. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. And, and we had the National Day of Prayer, and not once was the name of God mentioned by the President of the United States. That is sad, my friends. Amen. And here we have, we, have a con we have, if you would, a society that is going against the teaching of God's Word. And you need to understand the opposition is coming. So there have been great things, and there's a lot of great victories going on in your life and in the life of the church. But you need to understand something. The opposition to the Word of God and the opposition to God is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's going to be disappointing. I don't want you to feel like you're beat up, but you need to understand something. It is disappointing to me to see a nation that is turning its back on Almighty God. Just watch what's going on in the Middle East. Yeah. You know, here we are, here we are as, as, as children of God. We understand the importance of Israel, and yet we have a group of people who are just, just defying Israel and what it stands for as a nation. My friend, we are going to see more and more of this. And here's what Paul is preaching. And here's the exciting thing. Look at verse 46. Because up to this time, Paul's preaching. And here he's preaching the word of God. And he's preaching primarily to these Jews. He's preaching to the Jews in these cities. There are some of the Gentiles, which would be not of the Jewish race. You're Gentiles. Most, in fact, I think all of us, most of us here. Gentiles, those that weren't, aren't of that race. He's preaching to the Jews. But notice what happens in verse 46. The ones that are listening, it says, Paul and Barnabas says, It was necessary that the word of God be, should be spoken to you first, to the Jews. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to whom? The Gentiles. Hey, praise God. He had it in his plan. God had it in his plan to be able to share the word of God. In fact, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 49, you don't need to turn there because the words are already in verse 47. The prophet Isaiah in here in Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 47, it says, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. So now we see the message of the gospel. Listen, church, let me just encourage you this morning. You are here and you are part of the ministry of South Pie Community Church, not by accident. You are here appointed by God. God put you in this church. God put you in this family so that you can be used of God. But there are going to be disappointments. There are going to be disappointments. There are going to be disappointments in, in the church, disappointments with other people, disappointments, if you would, even with the leadership at times. But there will be a lot of victories for God's glory. Amen. There will be victories. Remember Psalm 139, verse 16. 
Even as, as David says there, your days are fashioned by God even before you were what? Even before you were born. You are here because God put you here in this family. And so you need to understand. And we, we, we don't know all that God has planned for us. But as we serve together, let me just encourage you. Be faithful. Be faithful through the victories. Be faithful through all the disappointments. Even if you feel like you're, you're sitting there today and you think, I'm, I'm like Elijah. I'm all alone. What did Elijah find out? God said there's all kinds of people who have not bowed down to Baal. There are all kinds of people who can serve God for his glory. So God, God put you here uh, for that purpose. And maybe some people move a little bit slower than you. Others might move too fast for you. But the point is God has put you here. And you need to understand there's going to be victories. But there will also be disappointments in ministry. There will be disappointments. And so we need to be encouraged. Because not only did Paul find this out. But it's true of all of us. So what do we expect next? All right, chapter 14, and I encourage you to read chapter 14 at least once this week, maybe a couple of times. But you need to understand in addition to the victories and in, in addition to what we would call disappointments, there's going to be some hardships. That's a little bit harder, worse than disappointments. I could be disappointed, but that's not necessarily a hardship. There are going to be some hardships, and some of them are going to even be prolonged in your life. Notice if you would at verses 1 to 3 of chapter 14. Let's start there. It happened in Iaconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews. They spoke that a great multitude both of the Jews and of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. So you see this, this ongoing, if you would, attack against the things of God. But I want you to notice something that's very important. In fact, I have this, this phrase circled in my Bible. It says, therefore, they stayed there. They stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. They continued to do what God had called them to. They continued to do all of the things that he had said even though these people were not receiving the truth. You're going to share the word of God, and some of you have family members who you've been witnessing to for years, maybe for decades. Continue to preach and to share the word of God. Let the word of God change their life. It's not your job to change them, but you need to continue to be faithful. Notice that even in the midst of all of this, as Paul says, there, it says they stayed there a long time. Now what happens? Look at the hardships that begin. Starts in verse 4. All of a sudden now, it, it, there, there are some divisions. Here's what happens. The mall of the two to the city was divided. Part of them sided with the Jews who didn't want the teaching of God's word. The other part, they sided, if you would, with the apostles, with Paul. And, and there begins to be this division. There was a, the opposition, as we mentioned earlier. The violence against the things of God. Listen, do you, think, do you think for one minute that the churches that have been attacked by shooters, the churches that have been attacked are just coincidences? This is the attack of Satan on the things of God. Our brother over in Kenya sharing with us how churches, numbers of churches, have been coming, they come to the service on Sunday morning, and, and all of a sudden in comes these, if you would, rebels, these violence, these people against the things of God's word, and they just mow down and kill all of the people, including the pastors and all of the leaders of the church. The attack against the church and the thing, this is going, these hardships are going to go on and on and on. In fact, beginning in verse 11, and this is kind of an interesting uh, part of the, of the uh, the instant or the history, the event here in Paul's life. Notice he begins to do, he does a miracle. And I just want to, I want to pause here and say this. In the early church, remember, God used various miracles in Paul's life to prove the validity of the word of God. We don't see these, we don't see these miracles today. All right. So when you turn on the television and you see a, a, a preacher standing up and he's healing people, you know, because of his works, he's hitting them or he's doing different things, so on and so forth. Those are not the miracles of God. Okay? Amen. Those are not. Amen. Can God perform miracles? Absolutely. We've seen it many times over. Yeah. 
But in the early days of the church, these miracles were performed. And so here's what Paul does. You'll notice he, he heals this man in verses 9 and 10. Now notice what happens. When the people saw what Paul had done, verse 11 in chapter 14, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas, they called Zeus. Paul, Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of the city, he brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. They were going, they're setting up Paul and Barnabas and these other preachers, they're setting these men up as being gods. They want to worship them. Verse 14, but when the apostles, Barnabas, Paul, Barnabas and Paul hear this, they tear their clothes and they go in among the multitudes, crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We are just men with the same nature as you. And we preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with all these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Folks, we have today a group of people who want to give, if you would, obeisance. They want to worship the earth. They want to worship other men. They want to worship different people and put them on a pedestal. Let me just share with you how many times that even, even, even worship leaders and churches have been ruined because they follow a man. They follow some person, and that person is not a god. And, and they put these people on a pedestal, if you would. And that's exactly what happens here. And so they begin, if you would, to worship. But I want you to notice then, as Paul shares with all of this, and he stops all of this, so on and so forth, they begin to turn against him, and the the worst, if you would, the harshest thing is death in these particular passages. Look at verse 19. They stone Paul. These Jews, they're, they're so upset. They take him and they stone him and they put him outside. They drag him outside of the city. Uh, we had mentioned that before, the reason for doing that. They drag him out of the city. They thought he was dead. But obviously he wasn't and God used him. So now you have all of this negative. So here's all these great things are going. And maybe things are going great in your life. And, and God's doing great things in your life. There's going to be disappointments. There's going to be hard hardships in your life. Some things are prolonged. Some things just keep, seem to keep piling on. It just seems to be very, very difficult. But so I want you to notice in, in these particular verses, beginning in verse 21, the importance of what Paul did. When he had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples... They then returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Here's the, here's the point. We'll continue reading in a moment. Even in the midst of all these difficulties, in spite of all of the opposition, in spite of all people stoning him, what did Paul do? He continued to minister, and he continued to do what God had called him to do. You have hardships in your life. You have difficulties in your life. You might even have struggles within the church body at times. You still serve God faithfully. Don't give up serving God because of some hardship or some difficulty. Notice continued in verse 22. He then went about strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to come, if you would, to continue in the faith. And he says, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And then they went on to Pisidia, and they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed, sailed again to another Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now when they had come up and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them, and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And so they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Listen, folks, contrary to what these prosperity gospel pastors have to say, I call them pastors, preachers, talkers, whatever you want to label them, contrary to what they have to say uh, and, and preaching, telling us that our faith, you know, is going to make us healthy, it's going to be wealthy, everything's going to be great. Uh, you know, we're going to hear all of these things. There, there's a Greek word. There's a Greek word for those that believe that. 
You know what it is? Baloney. <laughs> it's false. How do we know that? Throughout Scripture, we, we read it all the time. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, he says, he reminds us, your faith is going to become more precious even as it is tried by what? Fire. That's, that's the essence of this hardship in your life. Hebrews chapter 12, read verses 3 to 11. Just be reminded of it. Even, even the Lord's chastening is there to correct us. You know, the, the Lord chastens and he, just, he says, even as a, he says a human father corrects you, so why shouldn't you expect your heavenly father to do that? Because he will yield that faith and, and that fruit in your life. So listen, what we learn from Paul is the importance of understanding. There's going to be great victories in our life as a church, great victories in the life of you as individuals. There's going to be difficulties, and there may be some things that prolong themselves, even hardships that God will continue to work, and we need to continue to be faithful. Now, I want to share something with you in closing. I'm going to ask you to turn over to the book of Colossians, chapter 4, because I think this is the essence of how we can accomplish this. In Colossians, chapter 4, it's page 1355 in the Pew Bible. Colossians, chapter 4, verses 7 through 14. I want you to understand, again, the importance of your church family and the importance of you to your church family. Notice, and we read it already there in Acts chapter 14, verses 27 and 28. Paul goes to these churches. He tells them what's going on and, and shares the needs that they have. He shares everything that's going on in his life. Now, I want you to notice something here at the end of the book of Colossians chapter 4. And I think it's interesting the way Paul puts his writing here about these particular people. This is sometimes called a greeting. He's, he's, he's sharing something with these people. So, for sake of time, let me just quickly go through this in Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Tychius, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, we will tell you, he will tell you all the news about me. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. He's coming there along with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will make known to you all things that are happening here. Let me just share, first of all, they shared the needs with each other. You have Tychus, who's a beloved brother. He's somebody who's very close to Paul. He was a faithful minister. He was a faithful servant. You have Onesimus, the same type of man. What was their purpose? Verse 8. Their purpose was that you would know what was going on in their lives. Church, let me tell you something. The one, one way that all of this will happen, if, if you're going to get to know the needs of this church body, if you're going to get to know the church family so that you can support each other and strengthen each other, it's more than on Sunday morning. It needs to be more than Sunday morning. You need to have that contact throughout the week, if you would. Notice it says they showed comfort, the concerns. You know, doesn't Paul tell us in Romans 12, it's verse 15, he says, you know, when, when somebody is hurting, you hurt with them. When they weep, you weep with them. He says when you rejoice, you know, when something's going great, you rejoice with them along the same lines. You know, when Ted and Sharon said just a couple weeks ago, you know, how quickly God, God sold their house. You know, we all rejoiced, didn't we not? You know, if I remember correctly, some people even caught. You know, why? Because we want to rejoice with people when things go positively, but there's also that comfort. And that's what Tychus were in Onesimus. They were sharing the needs of Paul. But I want you to notice, beginning in verse 10, and there's a whole list of people here. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to mention their names. But I want you to notice, beginning in verse 10, what can you learn about the advantage of having Christian friends? What can you learn about, about having the, the disadvantage, if you would, of being a part of the church family? He mentions Aristarchus first. Aristarchus was imprisoned with Paul. He sat with him side by side. You need people in this church who stand by you side by side, regardless of the circumstances. When things go wrong in your life, when things go great in your life, you need to have somebody that is an Aristarchus who stands beside you side by side, helps you, strengthens you. And I would encourage you, husbands and wives, it's somebody of the same sex that you can spend time with, that you can indeed grow together, and they stand there and they give you encouragement. I have at least a couple of men that I am confident in, and they stand side by side, and I share my particular needs with them. And they are there to encourage me and to strengthen me. And yes, they also tell me when I'm wrong. 
And that's what Aristarchus was. You also need, notice also he talks about John Mark. Notice, remember with John Mark there in verse 10. This is the same Mark, John Mark. He was on the first trip with Paul. He left. And later on he's in the ministry with Barnabas. Now he's back with Paul. What's, what's, the, what's the lesson here? Listen, maybe you failed God somewhere along the way. You've, you've even turned away from, from things of God in your life. Listen, be a John Mark. Be somebody who comes back and gets back into the game, if you would, and you serve God faithfully. Don't allow your past. Don't allow your past to keep you from serving God. You need those types of people in your life. What about Jesus or Joseph? We don't know much about him, but he was a faithful believer, it says here. He served the Lord, but nobody knew what he did. We need those types of people in the church. You need those types of people in your life. They serve God. They do things for God. Listen, as a church, as an individual, we need somebody who is doing those types of things. It's, it's unknown. That's why I like the, uh, the ministry that our ladies have done over the years. You know, the secret sister type of thing. You encourage one another. You don't know who it is. You know, you, you try to figure it out during the year, I understand. But you don't, you don't, you don't, why? You have somebody who is there who's just kind of working behind the scenes. Quickly, look at Luke. Luke is another one. He's probably the only Gentile writer uh, in the book of the Bible. He was a physician. He had a high, if you would, he was high regard in the community. Luke was one of those types of people. You, he was Paul's personal physician, by the way. We read that throughout the scripture. You need people in your life who are going to meet specific needs. There are people in this church, there are people in this church that are great mechanics. You need those people. The church needs them, do they not? Because they could use that gift to serve God. There are people in this church who are good plumbers. We might need your help from time to time. We're looking for a good electrician. God provided somebody, but maybe there's somebody, you know, it isn't, it isn't these particular things. But you need those people in your life. Those people that you can count on. The church needs them. People that, that, you know, if something goes wrong in the church, you get on the phone and they take care of it. They take care of that particular problem, whatever it might be. Notice Epaphras here. He founded the church of Colossae. You can read that back in chapter 1. But you notice what it says about him? He prayed fervently. He personally was involved in their lives. In verse 13, he said he basically sacrificially helped. He had a desire, a zeal to want to help people. These types of people you need in your life. And we need every one of you in this church. Some of you in this church are Aristarchus. You have a great ability to be able to stand side by side with somebody. Maybe some of you are like John Mark. You, you've gone away from the things of God, but now you know that God is calling you to serve Him faithfully, and you come back and you begin to serve God. Maybe you're a Luke. Maybe you have a particular, if you would, ability that you can serve other people with. Maybe you're an Epaphras. You have, you, you're the person who just, you pray fervently for people. You want to find, so you get to know people, you find out what their specific needs are. Are you understanding the importance of these people? Read through this passage here in Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 14. Just to understand it. We, who are you in the church? What is it that God has called you to do? And as a result of that, you used of God. Listen, there's going to be great victories in the church. Amen? Great victories. We've seen many of them. There's going to be disappointments. There's going to be hardships. There's going to be difficult times in our lives. But as a church family, we understand, as Paul, we saw this, we see this throughout his life in these three chapters, how God used them greatly. And with your help and your encouragement, you can share with one another. You can be the body of Christ that God wants you to be. Learn from the Apostle Paul. We can accomplish much for God's glory and strengthen one another along the way. Learn from Paul if we would this morning. Father God, I pray that you would just continue to teach us, that you would continue to encourage us as we think about Paul and, and the things in his life. And Lord, even in these three short chapters, we realize there are a lot of encouraging things in our lives. There are also difficulties and hardships. But as a body of believers, as we see here even in the church of Colossae that was written to by Paul, there is a, in this body of believers, those who can meet specific needs be used of God for His glory. Might we all be these types of people. Might we all be an encouragement to one another so that as we go through ministry for you, you, and you receive the glory. And as a result of that, Father, other people come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Teach us from your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Encourage us. Amen. Amen. We're going to close today's service by singing uh, hymn number 247. It's entitled Spirit of the Living God.
The importance of understanding the Spirit of God working, the living God working in our lives. So let's stand together in closing and sing. We'll sing through it twice uh, and then ask the Lord's blessing as we go from His house. 247. today let me just encourage you you know the words of that hymn you know melt me sometimes it means you know a little bit of a humbling in my life mold me you know use me melt me make me what you want me to be for your glory going to be great victories even disappointments but may God continue to use us we're faithful for him father thank you for the lesson from the apostle Paul on his life my we as a church continue to be used of thee Thank you for your presence today uh, here in our midst. And then also, Lord, I pray that as we go from your house today, that you would indeed use us for your glory. Might the Spirit of God continue to work in our hearts and then just mold us and direct us to where you would have us be used for your glory. Well, then might we reach out to one another, know the needs, know the hearts, know one another for your glory, we pray. Might you be blessed in all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The Lord bless you as we go from his house.